It's a privilege to be with you today. Today we're going to uh, we're going to cover things from an angle that addresses the ex witnesses that may be here, ex witnesses that may watch us on a YouTube video at some other point, doing a live video right now with members in uh, our Facebook group. But today we're going to talk about the struggles after leaving an organization such as the Jehovah Witnesses. There are certain challenges that people go through. But as you listen to me, remember that the same problems and the same things affect all of us in life. It just has a different topping on it. So even if you weren't raised a Jehovah Witness, you're going to find a lot of truth in what I'm saying. So take some copious notes today. I'm going to go through a lot of things. Now imagine someone that's been in prison for 30 or 40 years. Imagine someone who was actually raised in prison, born in prison. And that person's viewpoint of a good day or a bad day is within the bounds of those walls. That person looks at life through what they know. If that's all they know. You know, people who have been in prison for an extended amount of time have been what's called institutionalized. Some people commit crimes to go back to prison because they don't know how to live in the real world. They need to be told what time to get up. They need to be told what time lunch is, how much time they got in the play yard, what they can and cannot do. And they get in the real world and they cannot survive because they're not wired to live in the real world. And for a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, this is what it feels like to them. They're wired for something they're no longer a part of. Imagine a group of people who live in a town all by themselves. Everyone thinks the same. Everyone dresses the same. And in this town, every electrical outlet is, is weird. It's got like five prongs to it. And all your electrical outlet, all your you know, devices and your appliances have this weird plug on it. And all your life, all you've known is that's what an electrical outlet looks like. And one day you get kicked out of that town and you take your appliances with you and your electronics with you. You can't plug them in. And you think something's wrong with the wall outlet when it's your cord that needs to be rewired. It's just the same when you leave an organization like that. It is your mind that needs to be rewired. And until we do that, we struggle. And until we do that, we're missing the mark of what we all want. We all want to be happy, don't we? Life's not very enjoyable if we're not happy. Life's not really enjoyable if we don't really live the lives that we were intended to live, to share our gifts, to live our dreams, to reach our highest potential. Life is very unfulfilling. You know, the great author and poet, Miss Maya Angelou, once said, she said, there's no greater agony than the bearing of an untold story left within. That means too many people live an entire lifetime and die with their dreams inside of them. The music is still inside of them. No one wants to live like this. So how do we get from being a Jehovah's Witness to being at a point of happiness? You know, a lot of people, when they leave that religion, first thing they tell me is they say, I'm free. The first thing I tell them is you are the furthest from free. You have no idea who you are. You've walked away from your entire identity. That does not make you free. It's a journey. There's work that needs to be put in. There's a vision that you have to have for your life. And until you do this, you are not free. You're not free by any means. It's like someone who jumps off of the Titanic. You might have said, you know what, that boat's going to hit that iceberg and I need to get off. And you jump in a life raft and you don't know where land is. And you can't read the stars. And you got no rudder. You got no compass. You got no GPS. You're floating at sea. It's cold. It's damp. It's dark. It's scary. And you want to run back to the ship, don't you? You've been there, right? I heard your, your story earlier. You want to run back to the ship because you had friends on the ship. The ship was warm. So you run back. Now what I want to do today is to give you a template. To give you the tools for those of you 
who are still struggling with this, for those of you who are watching us later, for those of you who are watching now, to give you a template of what you need to do to get yourself on the path to true freedom and happiness. You know, last night many of us had dinner, and I, I spoke of the five stages that witnesses go through after they leave the religion. So let's go through that again. I'll go deeper into those things. And then you can identify if you are ex-witness. And for those of you who are working to free ex-witnesses, you can kind of understand where people may be at when you speak to them. Five stages. The first stage is a stage of doubt. You usually are going through this stage while you're still in the religion. Things don't sit right with you. You might find something out by accident that you didn't know about the religion because they protect information so closely. You might go to an assembly and say that this doesn't sound right or this new light just sounds wrong. Whoa, whoa, wait, whoa. It's not right. I remember when they changed the definition of a generation in 1995. That threw me for a loop because I was already saying, if this religion goes to 2000 <laughs> and the end hasn't come, they're in trouble. I was already thinking that. And then they changed it. And I remember going to the meeting and, and, and a bunch of sisters were saying, Ooh, have you heard about the new light? And I was like, are you crazy? They have to change that. You see, for me, that was the first little crack in the windshield. See, for a windshield to crack open, it needs to be a small crack. That small crack keeps spreading. And that's the first stage, that stage of doubt. For some people, they might have found out about some of the um, molestation cases and the pedophilia cases. That was the thing for them. Maybe that, hit, that's, you know, they're very sensitive about that thing. Whatever it is, we got doubt. Some of you got doubt while you were disfellowship. That's a little tougher. Some of you, I mean, there's people who have been out for 20 years that still call it the truth. But something woke them up while they were disfellowship. And when you solidify that doubt, you go into stage two. Stage two is a stage of fear. You see, even if you're disfellowship, in your mind, you're going back one day. One day, as soon as you get done with this sinning or whatever, whatever it is, got you out. Now I'm going back. One day when I get my act together, you know, you're judging yourself, but you're going back one day. It's devastating. And for those who are in it, it's even more devastating. Fear. What are we fearful of? You're fearful of losing everyone you know. See, a lot of people want to Forget all the good memories of being a Jehovah's Witness. And I don't care what it is in life. There's some good things to almost everything. We have the privilege of keeping the same friends forever. Not many people have that. I had some friends from the time I was 5 or 10 years old into my 30s. Same friends. All these memories. Good times. When we go camping, we go camping with 30, 40 different families sometimes. We go to a movie, we go 30 deep, we got three rows taken up. We go to a restaurant, they, they don't got enough tables. We, we, we come in with you know, a whole bunch of people, we're used to that. That was the good part, that social part. Now you got doubt. All of that is threatened. All of that. Your family relationships, threatened. Every human being has an innate need to be loved. It's human. You need love. Without that, <laughs> the world is tough. As you are in this stage of fear, you realize that everything is threatened. And one of the biggest things that is threatened is your belief system. No one likes their belief system challenged. You know, when, when people thought the earth was flat, and some of you might still think the earth is flat. Huh? That's making a comeback. <laughs> it was devastating to the people who believed that to change a universal belief like that. You see, you're, you're looking at the world through certain lenses. 
And now I've taken away your glasses. It's scary. It's fearful. You fear being found out. You fear other people can hear your thoughts. Imagine you're married. You're married with a couple of kids. And you're doubting. And your mate's not on the same page. That's where I was. It was horrible. I was married with two kids. I employed 18 witnesses. I was the guy everybody worked for. Every, every congregation's got that guy, right? Go get a job from brother so-and-so. That was me. H how am I going to maintain my business? I employ 18 of these people. They will be gone like that. My whole life was built on what I felt was a lie. And it's threatened now because I've got doubt. How many witnesses just push that down and keep doing what they are doing just because they're afraid to lose everything? Fear. And to get to the next stage, it takes courage because this is when you really step away. See, only the courageous step away. So if any of you ever doubted and, and, and wonder if you feel like, you know, you're weak for leaving the truth, that's what they try to tell you, right? Like something's wrong with you, like you're weak. No, it's the courageous who leave. It's the courageous who question. It's the courageous that say, let me build my life all up over again from, from scratch. That's not the weak. See, it's, it's a religion where you get rewarded for lying. So long as you look a certain way and don't tell the truth, you never get in trouble, right? You, you went in and confessed, and what happened to you, right? You didn't have to tell nobody. Plus, they like two witnesses, right? <laughs> You got some strange fetish if you got two witnesses going on, whatever you do. So you are courageous if you do take that step to leave. Only the courageous leave. But then you move into step three, a, a stage three. Stage three is a stage of anger and resentment. For some people, depending on your personality, it could be hurt. Some people don't get angry, they get hurt. But for most, it's anger and resentment. And unfortunately, this is where most ex-Jehovah Witnesses stay for decades. Because they're focused at what they lost. They're focused on the hurts. They're focused on missed opportunities. They're focused on things they're finding out that they never knew while they were in the religion. I can't think of anything else that you could be more dedicated to and know less about. How many of you were shocked when you started really researching? Like, I didn't know this. Jehovah's Witnesses don't know their own history. And you get angry because you were a part of something. You, you feel bamboozled. You feel like Dorothy who ripped the curtain open and there's a little man pulling strings. <laughs> And then you want to tell people who won't listen to you. The, the more truth you put in someone's face, the more you're wrong, the more evil you are. You mention something they can't answer. Oh, you, oh, you an apostate? That, so they can just shut down on you, right? And it makes you mad. And you start seeing the organization in a different light. And you look at these people who, who run it. So instead of having you know, one Wizard of Oz, there's a body of them. And you're like, I can't believe this fooled me for so long. I'm upset because I was, I was gifted. I could have I got a college scholarship. Colleges wanted me. I passed it up. I'm mad because I married somebody I wasn't even in love with. Because you, know, you marry the first person you date. And I got kids by this person. I, don't, I never did love. I didn't even know what love is. Never went to a prom, never, I never interacted with the opposite sex. Now I'm married to somebody who I don't know. I'm mad. I'm mad because, man, I was the fastest kid in school. I was a great athlete, couldn't play. I'm mad. I'm mad and everyone needs to know. Here's a question. How are you moving your life forward in that state? I understand the state. I've been there. But how is your life moving forward in that state of anger and resentment? 
How are you using your gifts and your talents and your skills? Where are you going to be decades later? You see, if you wake up at 35 or 40 years old, yes, it would have been better if you woke up earlier, but life is what it is. And now you're 75 years old and you're mad at your life. Like my Angelo said, there's no greater agony than the bearing of an untold story left within. And you're looking at your life and you did not have the experiences you wanted. You did not do the things you wanted to do. You did not live the life you wanted to live. But guess what? From the day you left, it was your responsibility to change your life. You cannot blame the Jehovah's Witnesses for the rest of your life. At some point, you must take responsibility to get your life on track because life is not fair for no one. If you think it's all because you are a Jehovah Witness, that is not true. You can walk outside this building and someone else has got another story of why their life is the way it is. Everyone has a story. Every single person has a story. Someone got hit by a drunk driver last night and would never walk again. Is that fair? Someone just got a dire diagnosis of stage four cancer 10 minutes ago somewhere. Is that fair? I remember when I first moved to Vegas about five years ago, I, I met up with an old friend and she was so high on life. She was so high on life. All the these incredible changes that had been happening. She left a horrible relationship. She was so high on life. She had just come from a seminar that had her all pumped up and it was such a good luncheon we had. And come that Friday, I saw on Facebook that her seven-year-old son had stage four brain cancer. Not fair. But whatever we're given in life, that's where we have to live from. We have to move forward from that place. And if you want to leave stage three to go to stage four, where it starts going up, you know, it starts, starts getting sweet. It starts getting good at the next level. We have to be grateful for what we have. We have to live in gratitude. We have to count our blessings and not our challenges. Let me tell you something. If you've got real challenges in life, I promise you, they're less than the fingers on your hand. If you got real challenges in life, they're less than 10. For most of you, it's less than five. But if you were to count all the blessings you have, the things that you take for granted right now, you couldn't count them. There's so many things going right in your life. You don't appreciate your good back until your back goes out. If you got chronic, chronic pain, you say, if this pain would go away, I would be the happiest person on earth. That's all I want. Let's get perspective on our past. Stage four is a stage of discovery. And to get to the stage of discovery, we must lose the labels. Lose the label of ex-witness. You're just you're who you are. You, you, you get to define yourself brand new. Whatever way you want to define yourself moving forward, that's up to you. But lose that label. It's like a man that keeps calling himself an ex-con trying to get a job. Most ex-witnesses define themselves by the religion still. Lose the label. Allow yourself to write a brand new story. Wipe the chalkboard clean and look at everything from fresh eyes. What do you believe? You see, a lot of people, the pendulum goes all the way, right, from, from being a witness to being an atheist. <laughs> it just goes all the way. Now, I'm not here to tell anybody what they need to believe. But you don't need to have your definition of God be what it was when you were a witness. Wipe the chalkboard clean and look at everything with brand new, fresh eyes. 
Allow yourself to discover something new. Allow yourself to discover a new version of you. Life is wonderful. Cut the ties. And stage five is a stage of self-knowing where you know what you believe, where you're comfortable with you. That's a wonderful place to be. Now, why do so many people get stuck in their programming? How does your mind work? Well, right now I'm going to describe some of the things that people go through in their struggles, and, and most of it's mental. Your mind is programmed by the time you are eight years old. The way you see the world, the template you look through, is programmed by the time you are eight years old. This is why kids believe it's Santa Claus till they're about that age. You see, before that age, you don't have a filter. You can't filter information. So when somebody of authority tells you something, you instantly believe it. And for a lot of you that were ex-witnesses, you were raised that way. And trust me, if you were raised in Iraq, you'd be a Muslim, and you would tell me the Quran was the word of God. You see, we are simply, as yous, products of our programming. And we have no filter. Now what happens is when, some, when we have these authorities or the world that we live in that stamps on our minds that this is the way the world is, that filter does not develop in that area still. That's why the witnesses could say, we got new light, okay. They can say anything they want, okay. Because we don't filter it. We have three components of our minds. The conscious, the subconscious, and the creative subconscious. We like to think that we are what we consciously think, and that's the furthest from the truth. Our mind's like an iceberg. You see what's above the water, but what's under the water is much bigger. We're a product of our subconscious wiring. And until we rewire our minds, we struggle. You see, Brother right there was saying, he, he, you, you forget even being a witness, right? Sometimes, right? Because he rewired his mind. He rewired his mind. And that's what the rest of us who are struggling with that need to do, to rewire the mind. This is how your mind works. Your subconscious mind has file cabinets in it. And every drawer is a different subject of life. And in that drawer are files that have been put there during your lifetime. The files that are most important and the files that are closest to the front are the things that you did in the most repetition. That's why if you're right-handed and you tie your shoe, you don't think about it. Now, you might just be thinking, of course I know how to tie my shoe. Well, tie it with your left hand. You'll find you have to think about it because your brain's not wired to do it that way. So when I say, what did you do in repetition in your life the most have you ever done anything as repetitious as what you did as a witness they are very repetitious over and over and over again so the reason why people get stuck is because those files from the witnesses are still there and when your conscious mind goes to work and has a new belief a new idea a new philosophy for instance how many of you, after you left the organization, walked into another church and it was the weirdest thing and you shook and you, ah, I shouldn't be here, right? It was weird. Some of you, the first time you typed in something that they called apostate, you, you, your hands were shaking. <laughs> you, you, you thought the devil was sitting right next to you. That's wiring. It's just programming. So the way your mind works is when you have a, a thought or idea or, or something consciously, it goes from the conscious to the subconscious for an analysis. So to open the drawer of that subject matter and grab the file that's closest to the front, and then it ana analyzes the two pieces of information, and it'll come to a decision based on what's in the subconscious mind. So when we find ourselves sabotaging ourselves in life, we can't get ahead, we're blowing opportunity, we're just, we wonder why we feel so stuck 
and we're, we're ruining relationships and ruining you know, financial opportunities, all kinds of stuff. It's because what we consciously think and what we subconsciously think are out of alignment. And our subconscious tends to win. You know, they say close to 85% of all NBA basketball players go broke three to five years from retirement. And let me tell you why that is. You ever notice that a, a lot of hoopsters and, and, and new celebrities, wherever they travel around, they got, a, they got a posse of like 20 guys? It's because their mentality is not one of wealth yet. So they keep what they're used to around them. They haven't accepted subconsciously wealth. So they're not wealthy. They're a poor man making a lot of money. There's a difference. So when your conscious life or your reality does not match your subconscious wiring, the third component of your mind, which is the creative subconscious, and it has one job. The creative subconscious job is to make your subconscious correct about whatever it believes. That person will subconsciously get rid of all his money to go back to his comfort zone. And that's what a lot of people do when they run back to their organization, right? They're going back to their comfort zone. It has nothing to do with belief. It doesn't matter. They're just ignoring that. I got to get back to my comfort zone. So if we really truly want to change in life, it's about putting new files to the front of every drawer in those cabinets. And all that Jehovah Witness stuff, you put it in a box and you put it in the attic like your 2009 taxes. And you let the dust settle on those boxes. See, you can't really get rid of stuff out of your mind, but you can make it non-important. You can make it where you don't pull it up again. So this is how your mind works. And if we understand that, then we can program our own mind. It's what we do in repetitions. Now, how did our minds get wired the way it's wired in the first place from the witnesses? What did they do? What did they do that was so powerful? How did they wire us? Why is it the witnesses give the same answers to every question? Yeah. Right? Some of you, you know, got relatives that are witnesses. And my mom and dad will answer the same question exactly the same way, almost word for word. Why is that? How do you get like that? Programming and repetition. Now, let's check out what the witnesses do. Remember the Watchtower study? First of all, you're supposed to prepare it at home, right? And you read the question, then you read the paragraph, then you read the question again, then you underline the paragraph. Then you go, and then, whoop, whoop, let me back up. But let's give it real power. And let's grab a random scripture, and it's not even talking about what they said, and add God to the mix. Because now, this looks like it came from God. And you read that scripture in context, they weren't talking anything about that. But between periods, the period of this, this, you know, and the period, that little verse matches up to what they're saying. Let me tell you something, I can make the Bible say anything I want. If I take things out of context, anything I want. I, I could justify killing people, all kinds of stuff, if I take it out of context. And that's what they do with the watchtower, to give it weight. But you read the question, you read the paragraph, you read the question again, you underlined the paragraph, then you went to the meeting. And they read the question, and they read the paragraph, and they read the question again, and you answered from the paragraph. Right? Every hall had this guy. Remember that guy that never answered from the paragraph? He did his own research. <laughs> it's a little deep study. He got his hand up for like five minutes. So uh, paragraph four, um, he got his hand up over here. Um, that, let's read the question again. And, you know, he, he's trying to avoid this guy because he's not playing the game. That's that guy that's all into it. They never make him an elder, right? <laughs> But this is how they program you. This is why they all answer the same way. 
But it's not just witnesses. Everything out there is after your mind. The media is after your mind. Political people are after your mind. Everyone's trying to pro, pro, you know, program your mind through this process of repetition. So if you really want to move forward in life, you have to become the master and the guardian of your subconscious mind. You decide what you want to program your mind with. And the problem with a lot of ex-witnesses is they keep programming their mind with JW stuff. Let me tell you why this is. You see, human beings have a natural need to feel important, to matter, to be knowledgeable. We naturally need this stuff. And as a witness, we didn't get it on a personal level. It wasn't about us personally, but we felt special because we were in a special organization. We felt special because we had the truth and they did not. We felt special because we thought we had knowledge that other people didn't have. And then you leave the religion. What makes you special now? Yeah. You feel less than special. You don't have a career. Hey, I've been pioneering for 15 years. What kind of job can you get with that resume? <laughs> you don't feel special. Feels like the world's going 100 miles an hour and you're standing still. You feel like nobody. You don't even know how the world works. People always tell me, how do I make friends? You don't even get it. You don't feel special. So you know what ex-witnesses do? They become the anti-witness. In that vacuum that was there, when you took that religion out and you had that vacuum, you put the religion right back, and now you're the angry ex-witness. Now you feel valid. Now I can make YouTube videos and, and, and get a lot of comments. <laughs> now, now all the other angry people, I'm the hero, I'm the, I, I'm the guy, right? And you feel special. I'm not saying, listen, I, I get it, I get it. But a lot of that is just a human need to fit in somewhere. And until we see ourselves as bigger, we could get stuck because always ask yourself, is this taking me in the direction of my dreams? And for a lot of people, they don't even know what their dreams are. We're much bigger than that. Much, 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 much bigger than that. But this is where we get stuck with that kind of programming. As ex-witnesses, we get stuck in this treadmill of emotions a lot of times. We get triggered. How do you get past emotions? You've got to understand that emotions is one of the most powerful things in your life. It's like the fuel that you put in your car. You make or break your life based on emotions. You've got to work really hard to stay positive. You got to work really hard to, to, to find things in life that, that juice you up and make you feel good. And the first thing you've got to have to do that is this desire to do that. Let me show you the power of where you allow your mind to go. Every thought you have affects every cell of your body. Come, come on up, uh, Dave. Let me sh show you. Uh, yeah, Dan, Dan. Come on up. Um, let, me sh let me show, he's a big guy, much bigger than me, okay? Let me show you an example, okay? I want you to put your legs out like this so you got good balance. Come over here, away from that stick, okay, there you go. Good, good balance. My friends, it is imperative that we keep ourselves in a positive frame of mind regardless of what happened in the past. It's imperative because we physically get weak I want you to think of something that is negative. You don't have to tell me what it is. Just let me know when you have that negative thought. Okay? okay? I want you to put, there's two things I'm going to show you. Okay? So, don't, I'm going to push you, but don't move your feet. Okay? okay? You're a big guy. You don't have to move your feet. You have that negative thought. 
You're thinking about that negative thought. I'm going to push you and don't move your feet. You're thinking that negative thought? Are you feeling that negative thought? Come back again. Think of the proudest day in your life. The day that you felt really good. You felt really, really good. It was just a joyous, happy day. And let me know when you got that. I got it. You got that day? Okay, ground your feet again. Don't let me, pu don't let me push you back. You got that day. Yes. Are you feeling good? You're yes. feeling that day, right? Yes. Doesn't move. Thank you. important to keep ourselves in a positive state of mind. It's important to have routines in life that move us forward to where we want to go. It's important to know who we are apart from the religion. Who are you? Apart from your mother, apart from your father, apart from even your mate and your kids, who are you? Most people, not just ex-witnesses, most people have never pondered that question. Who am I? Who am I? You see, you can't get somewhere if you don't know where you are. Try and set your GPS where your GPS doesn't know where you are and see if it can figure out where you're going. The problem is, too many people try to figure out where they're going before they figure out who they are and where they are. Who are you apart from this religion? You're bigger than an ex-Jehovah Witness. Someone who's decided to not do crime anymore is bigger than an ex-con. Define yourself as something bigger. See yourself as something bigger. But to do that, we've got to lose fear. And that's another thing that is put in us. To do that, we need to connect with who we truly are. My friends, listen to the words of this poem, and it goes like this. It goes, raised in beliefs that were not mine. A detachment from my true self showed over time. A lie I lived for so very long, not understanding my truth about what's right and wrong. Like a chameleon, I would change my colors at will, so the people I love would love me back still. But is it true love if you take it away because something called truth is not seen the same way? You see, we all have the power to use our own minds and seek understanding that we all wish to find. This journey is mine. It belongs to no other, no brother, no sister, no father or mother. See, I was created unique and like no one else, but my talents and gifts were then put on the shelf. But now it's time to break free from these chains and shatter the bondage that's inside of my brain. See, I finally am free. I can soar to the sky. I, I was created in the image of the one who's most high. I didn't know I could write poetry till I was 44 years old. That's how detached I was from my true essence. That's how detached I was from the gifts that God gave me. I was 44 years old. And I was working out some of this stuff with the, you know, coming up a witness. And I was attempting to journal, and I wrote that in five minutes. There's something special in each and every one of you. You see, the first goal is to find out who you are and to become happy. Even if you want to be an activist. I'm not an activist. But when you get to a happy place, if that is your calling, you will see it. See, some people have that calling. Some people have that calling. They're going to be an activist about something. Some, some people have a calling to make what's wrong right. But you've got to take care of you first. Don't think you're something because you're angry. Don't just be something because you're angry and you want to make Don't waste your life on that. But if that is your calling, whatever your calling is, find yourself first. Find what was put in you. You see, the gifts that were given to you are not for you. That poem wasn't given to me for me. That poem was given to me for you. 
So what is in you? To find that, we got to lose the sense of fear. Fear, false expectation appearing real. All cults use fear to control people. You need fear, you need an enemy, and you need a hope that only comes through the organization. Politicians do this all the time. How do you control people? By those three elements? I'm not making a political statement one way or another because I'm not here to talk about politics, but I'm going I'm to tell you something. Fear immigrants. Enemy is Muslims. Make America great again. You become president. <laughs> I'm not making a political statement. That, that is just the blueprint. Let me ask you something. What was Hillary Clinton's slogan? What was the hope that she gave you? That's not hope. What is the hope that she gave you? She gave me no hope. That's why she lost. That's why she lost. It's that simple. Create fear and create something to give you hope from that fear. And that's what the witnesses did. What happens when you show children images of dead people all on the ground, blood all over the place, dead babies, fire coming from heaven? When I was 13 years old, I woke up. I heard, I heard sounds of explosion. And we lived in this house. My older brother lived in the house next to us. And the house next to his was on fire. But when I looked out the window, our garage blocked the view. All I could see was orange. Whatever I could see was orange. And things were popping. I was about 13 years old. I got on my knees. I started praying. I thought it was Armageddon. I mean, I was crying. I was shaking. I was thinking of anything bad I did. I wasn't quite baptized yet. They've been telling me to get baptized. I'm not baptized. I'm like, I am done. That's program fear. You know how many people carry that for the rest of their life? How many ex-witnesses fear getting in trouble? Fear the elders. Fear this authority. How many of you were told you, you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z for fear you might get in trouble? Man, I heard, I heard, uh, I think my brother told me this, but... Um, he didn't go to his class reunion because they said something about an uh, old flame. Something might flare up with an old flame and you might get in trouble. Grown people. And my brother got, ah, I wanted to go to my reunion, but I'm not going to my reunion because the watchtower said, you're a grown man. You're 40 something years old. Married at that. Going with your wife. And you know you didn't have a girlfriend anyway. Fear, fear, fear everything. And this is the problem when, you're, when your mind is wired that way. As much as you might reject the doctrine, you still carry the way of thinking. When did that organization ever teach you to be courageous for yourself? So you're courageous for the religion. You're good at that. You could sit down, a whole stadium of folks doing the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem. You sit down for the religion. But for yourself, you were taught to be like sheep. You know if one sheep walks over, the, the lead sheep walks over the cliff, the rest just follow? Sheep aren't the smartest animal. Now, I get what they were saying about that, okay? There's a, there's, they take things like that, they blow it way out of context. Fear. We got to conquer fear. We conquer fear with courage. We conquer fear by not being afraid of failure. Nothing happens 
from this space of fear. We conquer fear by focusing on our successes in life. So when you were thinking about that day that made you feel proud, you became strong. Focus on your victories. This is so important with the women especially. We're gonna move into the area of esteem. Most ex-witnesses struggle with healthy esteem. You women didn't have a voice. You could be a 60-year-old woman, 15-year-old baptized kid. He's the only one at the car group. Who's in charge? How many women go to the elders? I don't even, I don't even know. The, I, I can just look at I can look at you and I know this. You go to the elders, they blame you, right? marital problems, you go to the elders, they blame you. My husband watches porn four hours a day. Well, are you giving him his due? Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. It's tough when you get in the real world and you, you, you gotta, you know, you watch these ladies that are just phenomenal. It's 2019, it's a different day and age. And for so, so many of us, we just, we hold ourselves back because our voices aren't heard. Remember this. Life is just the story that we tell ourselves in our head. Whatever we tell ourselves is the life that we live. It's not easy to tell a new story. But the first thing you have to want is the desire to tell a new story. So how do we get past some of these things that I spoke of? I got a few more coming up, but how do we get past these things? My friends, look at your life like a book that you're writing. Each chapter of your book is a year of your life. With every year, it's another chapter. And some of you might be, say you're 50 years old. You've got 50 chapters that you've written, right? But instead of writing the same book, put number, book number one on the shelf. Write the end to that book. Don't try to keep the story alive. The reason why people get so stuck is because they're trying to reconcile their life today with what their life was. When you put the book on the shelf, you've got brand new characters. This is a brand new movie. It's not Rocky 2, 3, Rocky 4, 5. No, it's, a, it's Rambo. <laughs> right? Sylvester Stallone, when he made Rambo, he wasn't looking for Apollo Creed. You don't, belong, you don't belong in this movie. It's a brand new movie. Your years as a Jehovah's Witness, put it on the shelf. See, you don't, what happens is people get such a sour feeling that they want to taint the whole book. It's like people in a marriage. People could have a wonderful marriage, but if it ends bad, that person's just horrible. You got no good memories. He's just a no good piece of trash. No, you had some good memories. <laughs> See, my book is on the shelf. My book called Rodney, the JW Years is on the shelf. It's not all bad. I had fun times with those people when I was that person. I have good memories of those people when I was that person. I'm no longer that person. I've moved on. See? It's a little too old to play Rocky. Right? Move on. Write a new book. Different characters, a different script. Then you begin to let go of the old story. You don't need to be right with those people from your past. Everyone is on a journey of life. And always be ready. When somebody's ready to listen, absolutely be ready. But it's still their journey. Like when we, when we see other people's lives, we have to look at their life as if it's their own movie. When they're ready to listen, jump in. If you get an opportunity, jump in. 
But we can't let their life affect us. We can't let what they think of us affect us. We can't let them draw us into their movie like we used to be. Draw a line. You've simply outgrown those people. Instead of feeling the effects of being this fellowship or whatever that label is, you've just outgrown them. They just have no use for your life today and what they think and their opinions. Allow yourself to outgrow those people. Also, lose the labels and the words of the Jehovah Witnesses. Don't ever say the truth. I know it's just a slang after a while, but your subconscious mind knows the meaning of the word truth. And the word truth is a good word. And when you're not in what you just said was truth, you have a tendency to self-judge yourself. And that's where a lot of people are stuck. If you're self-judging yourself, forgive yourself right now. If you're self-judging yourself as being less than worthy, even if it has nothing to do with the Jehovah Witnesses, for whatever in your life, forgive yourself. A lot of people talk about God's forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness, Christ's sacrifice, but they don't forgive themselves. Mistakes are part of the human experience. As long as we're on this planet, <laughs> it's not an easy road. Forgive yourself. Learn to let go. Learn to let go of things that don't serve you. Let, learn to let go of people who don't serve you, even if it's family. The best thing you can do for people is become who you were supposed to be. It opens up all kinds of lines of communication when you're truly happy. It opens up all kinds of discussion when you're truly living an authentic life. It's hard to deny that. Very few people live an authentic life. And that really should be a goal. As a Jehovah Witness, it's really tough to live an authentic life because that, that world is all about appearances. It's how you appear. That's how you go up the ranks. It's how you appear. I could go to a kingdom hall right now. Never open my Bible. Lie on my field service report and put 18 hours, 20 hours. Make up some Bible studies that don't exist. I give really good talks because I'm a professional speaker. Do you know how fast I'll be an elder? Because of appearances. But that's not what life's about. At the end of your days, it'll be about your authenticity. It'll be about the lives that you touched. It'll be about the experiences that you've had, the people that you got to love, not about the appearances you gave people. You see, your reputation is what people think about you. And I always say, it's not my business what people think about you. But your character is about who you really are. And now you have the chance to live in your full truth. To live in authenticity. Take advantage of that. There are other things that witnesses have issue with. Shunning's a big one. Label's a big one anyone out there in the audience, if anyone who watching me on this camera here or this camera here, if you have the label of being disfellowship, lose the label. It means nothing unless you consider yourself a punished witness. Lose the label. Stop giving them power. Don't ever call yourself this fellowship ever again. Don't look at yourself as this fellowship. Don't play by their rules. Label means nothing. Imagine this. I'm out of Starbucks. I see this older woman. 
And she says, are you Rodney Allgood? Yeah. Remember me? I'm Mrs. Connors. I was a 12th grade counselor back in 1985. Oh, yeah, Mrs. Connors, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, Rodney. But I got to tell you, you're still on detention. I never took you off detention. That's how silly disfellowshipping is. That's how silly it is. Whose labels don't mean anything to you? Whose labels create self-judgment? Whose labels make you feel ashamed when you see witnesses sometimes? Or sometimes those labels may keep you angry because you keep looking at yourself that way. At some point, you have to realize that you've elevated past these people anyway. My son got married. I don't have a label on me. Um, so I, I mean, I still get shunned in a way, but I still can attend family things. So my son got married about a year and a half ago and um, outside of L.A. So... Um, I go down, I took a date. I go down for the wedding, all witnesses. My two kids are raised witnesses. And I'm fine. I, because people react to your energy. I'm fine. I got a little goatee on, earring in my ear, right? And I got a date. And um, I remember meeting up with my family to eat. And I have a brother I hadn't seen in eight years. Um, I hadn't talked to my mom in, I don't know, it's been a while. I have a sister I hadn't talked to in at least two years. Um, so there's a lot of catching up to do. So we're sitting there. So, uh, Byron, how many publishers in your kingdom hall? Oh, we got about 70 publishers. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, so-and-so uh, got appointed out there. Really? Oh, yeah, well, he's doing good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so-and-so got sick, but her, her husband started coming to the meetings. Oh, I never thought he'd come to the meetings. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two hours of that. I live a pretty cool life. I speak to thousands of kids a year. High school, big assemblies, and done some stuff on TV. And my, my life's interesting. I do things in prisons. I mean, it's a lot to talk about. Not one question. Nobody cared about my life. And I said, if they said, There'll be no more shunning of family. We still ain't hanging out. <laughs> We're not hanging out. I mean, I, 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 I go by and say, hi, I love you and all this, but we're not hanging out because I've elevated past that. I want to talk about things that matter. So when you start to look at life this way, it doesn't bother you so much anymore. My old friends, when I see them, I wouldn't hang out with y'all no more. We wouldn't be close friends. And it takes the sting off of what you feel is going on. Sometimes we have this, this, this perception and this, this fantasy, like everything would be great if that was different. And I understand there's some situations that are very painful, especially if there's kids, very painful. I, I go through some of it myself. But some of these things are just stories that we tell ourselves. And we have to allow ourselves to elevate past that, above that. That that was a chapter of our life. It's no more. Remember, the opposite of caring about something is not hating it. The opposite of caring about something is apathy. See, if you have an ex and you stalk them on Facebook and you say you're over it, you're not. 
apathy. See, I view the witnesses like any other false religion. They're in the same bucket. I see them at their cart. It doesn't, it doesn't trigger me. It's just, ah, they're lost. They don't get it. They haven't woken up yet. But I'm not angry at them. They're just lost people. Apathy. Wash yourselves of it. And when you get the opportunity, see, when, when you arrive at a place of happiness, when you arrive at a place of, of knowing who you are, then people are looking at you wondering, how'd you get so happy? How'd you do that? See, a lot of people, when they first leave, the first thing they want to do is say, I got to wake, wake up my family. And, and you're miserable and you're, you're pissed off and you're just miserable. People won't follow you because they don't want to be like you. People follow people they want to be like. Remember when you went out in service and the good territory was always the poor territory? Because they had nothing, they had no hope, and you gave them hope, and they said, I want to be like you and share this dream. Then you went up the hill, out of poor territory. You got to lock your car, right? People got all kind of daddies in that neighborhood, all, you know, all kind of, this is the, the rough spot. But that's where, man, I placed six sets of magazines this morning. Then you go up on the hillside, and the people who contribute, the people who run the nonprofits, the people who got kids in college and just good, solid families, they didn't want to be like you. People follow people they want to be like. You see, you couldn't, you, they go, yeah, my life's happy. I'm, I'm okay. Right? You got to come with something more substantial than fear because they, they're, they're past that. So when you build your life up, and you know the way. Like, I was a witness, now I'm here. Now I can show you the way. See, I use this analogy all the time. Imagine, it's 200 years ago, and it's down south, and some slaves are working in the field picking cotton. And here comes a runaway slave, broken chains on his hand, sweating, torn up clothes, and he's just running. And he calls, he goes, come on, let's go. Where? What are you talking about? Let's be free. Follow me. Where are we going? I don't know, but let's run. You're not following that guy, right? Because he's not truly free. People are not going to follow you unless you know the way. Next day, Harriet Tubman comes by. Late at night. Psst. Listen, I got a string of houses all the way up to Canada. I've done this many, many times. Meet me here at 1030 this time tomorrow night. I've never been caught. You follow her. Because she was free. Truly free. The first thing we have to take care of is ourselves. When your cup overflows, you're good. This is why I can do the work that I do today with all the ex-witnesses or some of the people watching on the, my phone there. Because I'm full. It doesn't drain me to help other people. It doesn't drain me to, to hear the things I hear every day. If, if I was not full, I'd be done. If I was empty and I hear all these stories and I hear them every day, I'm on the phone with three, four ex-witnesses every day. Some suicidal, some got issues with their, I mean, just broken, you know, that need to be built back up. If I wasn't full, I couldn't do the work. I'd be done. Feel yourself. Take care of yourself. Give your score on these three things. 
mind, body, and spirit. Your mind. What are you taking in every day? What are, what are you reading? What are you doing to grow your mind with intention so you're not the same person five years from now that you are today? Never notice witnesses don't grow, don't grow. Like if you knew a witness at 30 and you know them at 60, they're exactly the same person in an older body. They don't grow. What are we doing to grow our minds? Give yourself a score from 1 to 10. What is your score? What are you doing to take care of your physical self? It's temple. So that, so, that, so that we're vital. So that we feel good. So that we have a, a few less problems in the world. Because this, this, is, this is what we gotta, we got to deal with. From the second we wake up, this is what we got to deal with. What are we doing intentionally to keep ourselves in a good place? To make choices, to keep this the way it should be. Give yourself a score of 1 to 10. And in your spiritual life, what are you doing daily to keep growing in that way? What are you doing to make that connection on a daily basis? You see, a life that's lived with intention is an amazing life. When you desire this in your life and you do these steps, this will appear. An intentional life. See, I haven't, I haven't had television in years. Now, that's not a statement about if it's good or bad, but for me, the reason why I don't have television is because I like to be intentional about what goes in my head. I watch things. I mean, I'll, I'll get a video or whatever, but I'm intentional. So I don't just let things go in my head. Begin to live an intentional life. Begin to know what your why is at this stage of your life. That's an important thing. And this has more to do with the stages we go through than being an ex-witness. But when we were a witness, our why was never ours. The thing that motivated us was never ours. It was their purpose, what they wanted. So some of us never really learned this. But what is your why? What makes you go every day? See, for a lot of us in the crowd, just looking at the crowd here, if I asked you what your why was for some of you, it might have been 25 years ago. For some of you, it might have been 10 years ago. For, for a lot of you, when you had kids and they were growing up, if I said, what's your why? Well, you know, your kids are in their 40s now, right? But if I asked you what your why was, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you would have said, your kids, this is what motivates me every day. That's my why. Well, life has seasons. And the problem that a lot of people have is they don't readjust their why to the season they're in today. And they feel lost. For a lot of ex-witnesses, you never, you never had a why that was personal. It was the why of the religion. What's your Why? What makes you do what you do? Where can you live a life to inspire other people? What do you have to offer that makes other people's lives better? What is it? Remember, life is merely the story. If you think you don't have something that adds value to other people, that is not true. You have to believe that you were given a gift. You have to believe that you have something to share. You have to believe that you have a legacy to leave on this earth while you're here. This is the words of this poem, and it goes like this. It says, if you knock, it shall be open. And if you ask, you shall receive. Now, what you need to find deep in your heart is faith and to believe. You see, having doubt is just like poison. It spreads death to all your dreams. But you having faith is the expectation that what you see will come to be. Now, never let anyone around you tell you what you can do, for they can't comprehend, nor can they understand, a dream that was meant for you. Now, the word fear stands for false expectation appearing to be real, but fear will dissipate. If you have faith, you'll find a strength that you can feel. Now, you've heard this said before, 
that there's nothing that you cannot do. Learn to let that sink deep in your soul and know this to be true. That if you believe down to your core, there's nothing that you can achieve. And it all begins, listen close, my friends, with a dream that you believe. Make space for a dream that's inside of you. Remember the sparkle that you see in people's eyes. You ever notice that little babies have this unbelievable sparkle in their eyes? Little kids have it. And as a person gets older, it gets glazed over. People, their eyes die. That sparkle in your eye is the reflection of your dreams. There's some people that are 80 who still have it. The reflection of your dreams. Do not let a religion, do not let a relationship, do not let past failure, do not let whatever obstacles are in your past, past abuse, any of that, affect that dream. Always let your past become your ally. Always let your past become your friend. You see, whatever you've gone through, someone can learn from you. With whatever you've gone through, you become an asset to others. If someone has a, a, a past of drug abuse, who's better to speak to people who are struggling with it than someone who's overcame it? If someone is struggling with relationships and you found a loving relationships, relationship and you've mastered some of the things that you did so wrong in the past, who better to advise someone of how to change themselves and how to attract the right kind of relationship into their lives? If you feel like the Jehovah Witnesses ripped off your life, if you feel like you were held back from being who you were supposed to be. If you feel the pain of shunning all the things that go with being a Jehovah Witness, who better to speak to that crowd than somebody who's overcame it? Always make your past your ally. Life's not perfect. A lot of times people think, well, that person that is speaking before us hasn't gone through what I went through. I got two kids that are still witnesses. I get it. I get the pain. But I still have dreams. And all of you, you're here. That tells me a lot about the kind of person you are. If you've been a witness or never been a witness, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm, I'm hoping that I inspire each and every one of you to step into your purpose. You know your calling. You hear your voice. A lot of you haven't answered it. God put something in every one of us. You hear it. It's there some point we need to heed it heed that call become who you always were meant to be listen to your intuition listen to that guidance that's within you we can wait for things to happen and they won't we can hope that things happen and they won't or we can realize that time is finite while we're in these meat suits. We could choose to do whatever our purpose is right now. We need to know what we want in life and we need to know why we want it. And trust me, the how will be provided to us. In closing, I have one more poem for you. It goes like this. In the blink of an eye, each moment becomes the past. You see, nothing stays forever. Only the memories last. A young woman should dream of her wedding day. But in a blink, the day is here. And then it's gone away. Our babies and toddlers, we watch them frolic and play. But in a blink, they grow up. And they're no longer this way. Now grown and on their own. In the blink of an eye. Sometimes we all wonder. When did the years pass by? In the blink of an eye. Our elders are gone. Suddenly it's upon us to pick up. 
and carry on. In the blink of an eye, we are young no more. So ask yourself this one question, what am I waiting for? Live a life that's inspired. Don't let it end with regret. Find your purpose and your passion, one this world won't soon forget. The time is now, you've got one life to live, so spread your wings and fly. For this ride, it may be over in the blink of an eye. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.